And next we'll have Arthur Levine. Good morning, everybody. So I want to begin with um, a confession and apology. The apology is, I have no PowerPoint. <laughs> that doesn't mean I won't need tech help, but I have no PowerPoint. <laughs> and the confession is, I would kill for a peanut butter and honey sandwich right now. <laughs> OK. Woodrow Wilson Foundation. Woodrow Wilson Foundation is a fellowship organization. It was created right after World War II. And the rationale for it was there were a tidal wave of GIs coming back, not enough professors to educate them. So they gave people fellowships, people who never, ever, ever, ever would have considered becoming academics to go take doctorates and join the academy. And I can boast about this because I had nothing to do with it. 15 of those people won Nobel Prizes, 30-odd MacArthur Awards, National Book Awards, Fields Medals, um, an Academy Award. My parents would have been so proud if I'd won any of those things. <laughs> when I got to Woodrow Wilson, what I wanted to do was focus not on professors, but on teachers and school leaders. I had written a series of reports, done a big, big study, which turned out far more negative than I imagined it would be, and concluded on schools of education, teacher education, school leadership education, research, and concluded, look, anybody can throw bricks. Can you make it better? And that's what we're trying to do. Let me give you this as background. The United States is making a transition from a national analog industrial economy to a global digital information economy. And what it means is that every one of our social institutions, whether we're talking about education or finance or government or religion or media or healthcare, they're all created for the former. And right now they all seem broken they once worked far better than they do right now. And what happens is they need to be refitted for a new era. And we're accomplishing this in two ways. One way is we're trying to repair existing organizations. At the same time, we're trying to replace them. Both go on together. There are some splits. For-profits change most often by replacement, not-for-profits by repair. There's a generational split. Older adults favor repair. And the reason is we remember when all these things worked. Surely they can be fixed. Younger people never remember when they worked and gravitate toward replacement. And in terms of all institutions, just to put it into perspective, when I arrived at Teachers College, it was before I started work, but I arrived. I got called to City Hall by then Mayor Giuliani, who told me what a terrible job I was doing <laughs> and how bad the schools were. And I was furious. And I said, don't you realize your industry is in the same shape as mine? You think people in schools are less able? We're far better in the past. We think the same thing about politicians. <laughs> you think, or you don't want to give us any money. We don't want to give you any money. You're telling me people are withdrawing from schools, they're sending their kids to the suburban schools. We're withdrawing from politics, we're not voting. You hate unions, we hate political parties. You hate tenure, we want term limits. And we both want somebody different in the other person's job. We're all going through the same problems. Mayor Giuliani never invited me back to City Hall. <laughs> so we're focusing on, on schools of education. We have two projects that can be described as repair initiatives. One's focusing on teacher education and the others focusing on school leadership. And what we're really trying to do is strengthen them. The teaching fellowship and is in five states, 
28 universities, one of which we're really pleased is Michigan State. Gail Richmond has done an extraordinary job. And there what we're doing is what everybody's talking about. We're all trying to do this. What we're doing is we're focusing on stronger partnerships with schools, stronger partnerships with arts and sciences and education, intensive clinical experiences, integration of clinical experiences with academic experiences, mentoring after people start the job, and third-party evidence-based assessment. So we also have one replacement project, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. We're trying to create a new graduate school of education, and we're doing that in partnership with MIT. It's called the Woodrow Wilson Academy for Teaching and Learning. It consists of a graduate school and an R&D lab. We think that both repair and replacement are required today. Replacement, because we think the model of how we prepare teachers is outdated for a global digital information economy. Repair, because it can be a long time until we create the next generation of model at any scale. We need stronger programs. We need to repair the existing programs. So here's what we're doing. The Academy is only going to offer two programs, teacher education and school leadership. It'll initially offer a competency-based master's degree program in middle and secondary math, science, technology, teacher education. Other fields are going to follow. School leadership programs will be added later. So will professional development programs in teacher education. What we're really trying to do is transform the existing model of teacher education. And what we're trying to do is we want that competency-based education to shift what, we, what we're concerned about, what we focus on, away from how long candidates have to be taught to what they need to learn and can do. We want to change the emphasis from fixed time, fixed processes, credits that you have to accumulate, courses you got to take, lengths of time students need to spend in seats <coughs> to achieving common time variable outcomes, the skills and knowledge necessary to be a successful starting teacher. The competency-based program has three components. <coughs> One's a set of outcomes or competencies. First person we hired for the project was Charlotte Danielson. So we began with Charlotte's competencies. And what we've done is we've augmented them in terms of the other competencies and competency models that are being used. We've also grounded them in the disciplines for which we're preparing people. And we've tested them with expert teachers teaching those subjects in the field. What stands out for us then Actually, I'm just going to move on. Second piece is assessment. And we want tools designed to determine candidate competencies at the outset of the program, to gauge their progress in terms of program, and to shape the course of study. Third component, all that'll matter is mastering. Curriculum. It's a problem-based, individualized curriculum tied to the competencies. It'll integrate clinical, simulation, virtual classroom, and traditional <laughs> academic instruction. It's organized around approximately 20 challenges, which are real problems that teachers face in real classroom. And every one of those challenges incorporates a set of competencies 
it's probably one of the things that we're doing that's differently, or di differently, that's different. Which is to say, most traditional competency-based programs treat each competence as discrete. And what we're saying is they're interrelated. You can't do just one competency at a time. Teachers don't do one competency at a time. So every one of the challenges is based upon a set of interrelated competencies. Students move through them at the pace of mastery. They graduate when they've mastered all the competencies. Some people could graduate in just a few months. For people like me, this could be a life's work. <laughs> the amount of time's gonna vary from student to student. And they're going to experience these challenges in a blended environment, including online, face-to-face, -face, and clinical education. Competency-based education, and I hate the word because it becomes such a buzzword, is really a potentially transformative idea in this sense. It eliminates the distinction between traditional alternative routes. They're about time. It should eliminate distinction between pre-service and in-service. They're all about building competencies and increasing levels. Rather than distinguishing paths to earning a degree or a certification by the amount of time it takes to become a teacher, what we're gonna do is we're gonna guarantee, no, I hate that word, what we're going to be able to say is the students who complete our program have the skills and knowledge necessary to become a starting teacher. And we're going to build this based upon the lessons we've learned from our teaching fellowship that I talked about earlier. We're also hooking up a lab to this thing. And, you know, we dream. And remember, these are big dreams. You've got to have a big dream. Huge. We want to be really happy. So that what's happening is when we try to think of what we'd like the academy to become, we're sort of hoping to create the equivalent of West Point in the sense of creating a really strong program to prepare people for a profession. And we think about the lab, the R&D lab. We try to imagine Bell Labs and the kind of work that it did. So what we're going to do is, we want to do intentional experiments. Imagine if you admit a group of students, and some number of them look like Teach for America, and some number of them look like career changers, and some number of them look like traditional grad schools, grad students in education. What can we say? about degree attainment, time to degree, student achievement in their classes, and retention in the profession. What we really want to do with this, aside from anything we do in terms of publishing, our goal for this is really to get it into the hands of policymakers. With our state teaching fellowship, what we've done is every time we've gone into a state, we've formed a coalition. The governor, the chief state school officer, state education executive officer, legislators on both sides of the aisle. Our goal, and weirdly, they've started calling for advice. And I finally figured out, why us? And the answer is we have no dog in the fight. You can entirely ignore anything we say to you with no consequences. You can adopt it and take complete credit for it. One day some governor called and said, I have a bill on my desk. Should I sign it or veto it? They don't know a lot about our issues. We want to share policy with them. We want to talk about what works. And that's what we really care about. We also want to do R&D. We want to invent. And the first thing we're doing is the subject matter competencies. We're also working on tools and games. And ultimately, what we would like to do is a classroom simulator, the equivalent of what we have with airplanes and flight simulators. 
That's a very, 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 very big project. I talked to the people in Madden Football to ask if they want to do this with us, and they said, no. <laughs> this is a much harder, much harder project than trying to create a football game. Okay. What we want for this thing to become is a resource center for schools of education. We don't want it to be viewed as a, a competitor. What happens is there's nothing we're doing that I haven't heard every other school of education in the country at least discuss, whether it's a blended education or it's games and simulations and new assessments, whether it's competencies or micro-credentials. It's just much easier to try them in a greenfield situation than trying to change an entire education school. And our hope is that what we can do is see what works. We're inventing a lot of stuff, and a lot of it probably won't work. But at least we can say that. We can play with our betas and try to make them stronger. The programs that we offer will operate under the dual currency of competency and credits. We have to do that for state licensure. Everything we create will be open source. And we want it to operate with exactly the same constraints as other education schools. We'll meet the accreditation requirements. We'll meet state approval requirements. We'll have comparable costs, funding, and pricing as university-based programs. We're going to share our research, both with universities and with policymakers. Come, take a look at it. If you like it, it's yours. Keep it. Take it all. Take part of it. It's up to you. What we want is, I can't wait to find out what it is. <laughs> We want this to be viewed as the equivalent of um, going to an, an automobile demonstration center. Just come, come see, come look. MIT as our partner. One of the things we realized was that it was essential that we create this with the university partner. And because we didn't want to be dismissed by potential adopters for existing outside the realm of higher education. We didn't want to be dismissed because this thing costs more to operate than a traditional ed school. We didn't want to be dismissed because we weren't charging tuition or we were charging too low tuition or we were relying upon large infusions of external cash. So what we did do is we sought out a university and the university we wanted to work with was MIT in creating this. And you know the reasons. It has a strong reputation. They're doing big work in STEM. Fact of the matter is, they didn't have an ed school, so there was nothing we had to change internally. We could start this from scratch. And they could help us in particular areas, we found out. The more we looked at them, the better this thing seemed. They could help us with the STEM disciplines, learning sciences, technology, games, and simulations. What really happened is this. When MIT was trying to, sub president of MIT and I developed this plan. And underlying it was this. He had had a futures commission. And the futures commission called for MIT, among lots of things, to do more in K-12, called for blended called for competencies, called for simulations and games, alternatives to seat time, and credit accounting, interdisciplinary and problem-based education. For the president of MIT, what this meant was he could do it piecemeal at the institute, or we could try this together as a whole. And that's where we went. They did a study which was amazing. MIT is, our offices are at MIT. 
Um, what's amazing about MIT is it's sort of like being in Willy Wonka's chocolate factory, with the single exception that the candy tells you whether you can buy it, the candy being the faculty members, so that they did a survey. They had no idea. They wanted to know whether they were really in education. And they found that their faculty were engaged in 125 research projects and demonstration projects in education and learning sciences. We're going to partner with selected school districts in doing this when we get started. And they're going to range across school districts. We thought, what do we want to be involved in? Most of our other programs focus on high need districts. If this is going to be a proof point, we have to be able to work with schools of all kinds. Where we stand is, before we started, we did a study with Bridgespan. We wanted to know whether to do this at all, and we asked three questions. Could the theory of change work? Could this be brought in for the price of a traditional ed school tuition? And could it be self-supporting? When Bridgespan said yes, we decided to go forward with Parthenon. Um, and begin to plan this thing. Where we are now is um, where we are now is it's a 30 odd million dollar project. We've raised 17 so far. The supporters have been foundations, the usual suspects. It's Gates, it's Carnegie, it's Amgen, it's Bezos, it's um, Simons, it's um, all the people who've invested in this sort of thing. And what happens is we're going to take our first class, but it won't be a traditional class in next year. What we're going to do is we're really hiring this class. They're going to be fellows. And we want them to do is test the curriculum. It's all new. We have no idea what works. And we want to find out what works with a real audience of students with a real group of students. And we're also working with school districts now. We're working with six districts in Massachusetts. And we've created a master teacher program for them. And by doing that, we're hoping to do is essentially create a nest for our graduates. We're also hoping, though, is to take the teachers through summer competency-based programs and develop a taste for competency-based education. And finally, maybe build a hunger for the graduates of this kind of program. The nice part about describing what I just described versus what Charlotte just described, hers is real. Mine's just a dream. Come back here in a few years, and we'll talk about whether this thing worked at all. Thank you. <laughs>